Can you do that? All right, we're recording now. So I think I have everybody admitted. We have about the usual number of people plus one or two. So we'll go in and kind of get our discussion going this morning. As you can see, we're going to be in Mark 6, uh, 30 to 44. That's the um, parable, uh, excuse me, the miracle of this commonly the feeding the, of the 5,000. Um, <clears> it's interesting to note, and if you want to, as part of our discussion this morning, um, flip over to one of the parallel Gospels. This is the only miracle that's actually described in, um, in all four Gospels. And so there's no, not another miracle that's described in all four. So the other passages are uh, Matthew 14, 13 to 21, and Luke 9, 10 to 17. And then John 6, 1 to 15. And can everybody hear me? Or am I talking loud enough? Do I need to? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Um, so there's those four, uh, three other parallel accounts to the ones, one we're going to look at here in Mark. And I'll try to, I've spent time this week actually looking at what each one says and how they're so subtly different. And I'll bring out some of those, um, some of those enhancements from the story that you get, we get from uh, looking at what, what, the, what the other gospel writer says. But um, so here we'll start off here and read it in Mark uh, together. But be thinking about a little bit, why is this miracle of such significance that it's, it's recounted in all four Gospels, uh, unlike many of the others that are only encountered maybe in the Synoptic Gospels or maybe in John, but not in, not in all four at the same time. I'm not sure I have an answer to that question, but it's one to kind of ponder, why is that the case? So let's, uh, let's read this together real quick. I'm going to read from the Holman Christian, um, just because that's what I had handy in one of the couple, two or three translations, translations I like to read from. Um, so we'll start off uh, Mark 6, uh, 30 to 44. It says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. For many people were coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they went away in the boat by themselves to a remote place. But many saw them leaving and recognized them. And people ran there by land from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. So as he stepped ashore, he saw a large crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then he began to teach them many things. And when it was already late, his disciples approached him and said, this place is a wilderness and it is already late. Send them away so they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. You give them something to eat, he responded. And they said to him, should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. And then he instructed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in ranks of hundreds and fifties. And then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looked up to, the he looked up to heaven. And looking up to heaven, sorry, he blessed and broke the loaves. And he kept giving them to his disciples to set before the people. And he also divided the two fish among them all. Everyone ate and was filled. Then they picked up 12 baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. Now those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So, um, So let's set just a little bit of a context here. What did we, what were we doing, uh, talking about last week? What, what's, what's kind of just happened that we talked about? And then there's one event that you can look back real quick um, in Mark and see that just happened just before this. Do you remember the context? <clears throat> He had sent the disciples out. Right. So, so Mark start, starts off this miracle discussion with the, the disciples are coming back and they're reporting back kind of what happened to them, you know, after he sent them out. And they've, they've come back from their journey, um, their mission, their mission trips. Um, what else? John the Baptist was beheaded. Right, and so Mark talks about that. If you flip back and just look at the headings, which we probably should be reluctant to do since they're not inspired, but <laughs> if you flip back and look at the headings, yeah, that's what's happened just immediately before this. And as a matter of fact, um, 
it's it's linked up a bit more. I think in Matthew, uh, in Matthew's account, he said Jesus had just heard about the execution of John the Baptist. It's like he heard about it and he said, okay, let's go get on a boat and get away. And so it, Matthew almost links those two things together that Jesus had heard about John the Baptist being beheaded. And then that sort of linked up to let's go, let's go to, a, let's go away. Um, in John, it's, it's a little bit different. He, he, John says sometime, uh, um, sometime later is I think how he starts the account of this miracle. And the sometime later, you know, what's before that in John is, is basically a description of some other miracles. And then a kind of a long testimonial uh, that Jesus gives about being the, being the father, uh, being the father's son and why he's been sent. And so, um, so there, there's probably a linkage there of why John picks this up, but it's not directly linked to beheading of John the Baptist quite like it is um, in, in the other gospels. Um, so anyway, interesting to me, but understanding just kind of what's happened and, and uh, where, where we are. So it says um, in the account in Mark here, I think, that they were withdrew to a, a solitary place. Why do you think, why did they do that? They went there to rest. They were, they were going to go there to rest. Yes, yeah, so Mark says that kind of explicitly that um, that they needed to find a place to rest. And then he's got that little description there about, um, you know, that it was so busy, kind of so many people bustling around, they couldn't even find time to grab a bite to eat. Um, <clears throat> Other thoughts about you know what what attracted them to a, a solitary place? Sadness. Well, you know Matthew definitely makes that link, so you've got to wonder if there's a bit of that, you know, of, of Jesus wanting to find a place, um, kind of where they obviously Jesus wasn't the only one that knew about it, so the whole community had kind of been hit with this news that John the Baptist had been killed. So maybe that was that was part of it too. Um, interestingly, Luke actually provides a name. For, uh, a couple of the gospels just have a kind of a general description of it being a solitary place. One of the gospels talks about it being, I think, east of the Sea of Galilee, and, and has kind of a descript descriptive um, location. And then John, uh, excuse me, Luke actually names the place as Bethsaida, however you say that word. Um, how do you, so when and what do you think Jesus is feeling then as he's um, as he hears the news of John the Baptist and he says and he kind of sees what all's going on and then he says let's go to a solitary place what do you think his, his thought process go ahead well certainly uh, you could uh, get a perspective on the the man side of Jesus. It, this is a sad thing. Um, it's also a time uh, where I suppose Jesus is hoping to reflect on what's the things that have just happened, both the disciples going out and what they had to uh, learn from that, and also what they needed to learn about John the Baptist. Uh, so it was a need to uh, for emotional rest, but also for probably some intensive uh, teaching for which they, they was best done alone. Other thoughts about, about what Jesus was kind of thinking and maybe what his motivations were for, uh, you know, trying to get, it didn't really work, but trying to get away with the disciples and find a solitary place. <clears throat> I kind of wonder how much time he had by himself before they get, before they all showed up. Before the people kind of ran around the ran around the sea or whatever and got to where they were. Yeah. Um, I almost am I also gonna say something? I almost have, you know, reading those first couple of verses there in, in, in Mark of this account. I almost have this wonder if there was a bit of that you know he had heard the news about john the baptist so he's probably aware of how that might impact them and then he's also um you know he's he sees what's going on and he talks about it was so busy they couldn't even find time to eat so he's, it's almost there's almost like a parental 
you know, like he's, he's worried about them. He wants to get them away so that they can have a little, a little peace or whatever. Um, and, uh, and find time to eat and kind of take care of themselves. And then, um, I wonder too, you know, they're also trying, this is, you can almost picture them all kind of in a big cluster there and everybody's coming back and each pair is talking about, you know, what's gone on and they're on their journey and what they've encountered and how they handle that. And I don't know, I wondered if, um, you know, there's probably an element of not wanting that, that time to be interrupted and be able to hear, um, hear all those accounts. Um, maybe he, maybe he's proud of them, you know, some of the things they've done that they've gone out and they've come back and this is their first kind of foray into that. Um, there may also be some things and we'll get hints of this a little bit in, a, in, in a, at least one of the gospel accounts of this miracle that maybe there's also some things he's identifying here, um, you know, as, a, as, the, as the leader of this group or as in a parental kind of mode or whatever. There's some things here that they're coming back and telling him that to identify he's got a lot of work yet to do to get these uh, 12 men where they need to be um, before he, uh, before he uh, leaves the planet, or not leaves the planet, but before he gets drawn, drawn back into, up into heaven. So any other thoughts on, the, on either one of those questions? <laughs> You know, maybe there's a thought too where he, uh, hearing what they had to say, uh, and then hearing about John the Baptist. I mean, they basically were going out and doing the same thing that John the Baptist was doing, and so to come back to report to him and find out that John the Baptist had been beheaded for the very same thing they were participating in, maybe it was a little unnerving to them. So maybe he was taking them someplace to kind of reassure him as well. That's a, that's a good idea. I like that thought. I hadn't, hadn't had that one. Um, so that's good. So maybe that's another kind of protective thing. He's, he's, he's worried about them and maybe how they might react to that. Um, did I hear another comment too about the same time as Randy was starting? Well, one thing's for sure. <clears throat> if you show yourself to be concerned and compassionate and interested in the downtrodden, you're always going to be in heavy demand. So it's not surprising he had a big crowd um, following him around and right there underfoot. Yep. So any other comments on this before we go on to the next slide? I think Jesus knew that he needed to grieve and I'm sure he knew that they needed to grieve plus eat and rest from their journeys and taking care of John. Uh, they didn't get to do any of that. <laughs> right. And it's not uncommon, even in our situation, you know, for families, you know, when they're grieving or whatever, to find kind of the need to get together and go kind of separate themselves from everybody else. So it's a pretty common um, reaction. Yeah. And, and it, obviously, they were very close to, to John. And yeah. His followers. Your thoughts? Anything else before we move on? Okay, so let me see if I can get the slide. I need to hit the right computer here. So how did Jesus feel then once he saw the crowd, you know, as they're getting around to the other side of the lake? And it, I think it's almost as they He saw a huge crowd. So he didn't get much, he got time on the boat with him, but he didn't get much time once they got around to the other side of the lake. So how did he feel, you know, once he saw the, once he saw the crowd? He was moved with compassion for them. So he knew what they needed and what they were looking for. And he knew he had it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me that that language, um, that's his, it, it's his first reaction is just to feel compassion, not to feel annoyance that here I've come all the way. <laughs> we've, we've just gotten a boat and traveled across the lake and we get here and it's not like, you know, wow, we just can't seem to get away from these people like, like we might have felt. Um, so kind of interesting. Yeah, compassion is the word that's used both in Matthew and Mark to describe it. I like the little phrase he's got there in Mark. Mark also says that he, he thought that they looked like sheep without a shepherd. Yeah. Which is pretty, a, a pretty hopeless thing, actually. Sheep are pretty hopeless <laughs> without a shepherd. Um, so you kind of get a pretty dramatic uh, impression there. In Matthew, it says he felt compassion and then he immediately healed their sick. 
So that was like his first, you know, it just like he could poured right out of him. You know, he felt compassion for them and almost immediately he just went right into healing their sick. And uh, Luke talks about him healing their sick also and says he welcomed the crowd. So not really compassion, but again, this totally different attitude than, you know, we might have felt if we had traveled across the lake to try to get away from them and exasperation that here, here they are. We didn't escape them at all, that he welcomed them. Um, and then John doesn't really talk as much about the, the um, how they felt maybe when they got off the boat as much as saying that he felt concerned for them. And he immediately wondered kind of what are they going to eat? So it's like he skipped, skipped ahead a little bit to the more the meat of the of the uh, of the of the miracle description. Um, so what do you think the apostles were feeling? What do they go to almost immediately? We don't have anything to feed him. Uh, let's send him away. And that phrase is like three of the four, I think, counts. It has almost that exact, if I remember right, has almost that exact phrasing. You know, send them away is kind of the, like these. So what do you, what are you thinking if you're sending somebody away? That's your response. You're not seeing him with the same eyes that Jesus is seeing him, that's for certain. Right. Give us a break. That's what I think. Well, yeah, so there's that us, like, you know, we're thinking about ourselves, right? So we're not thinking about them. Jesus is thinking about them, and he feels compassion for them. The apostles are thinking about, give us, that's exactly right, Kathy, give us a break. But I think there's also this kind of, you're not important to me. You're kind of more of a problem to be dealt with, and maybe the easiest way to deal with it is to let somebody else deal with it. You guys, please go away. You know, let's, Jesus, send them away. Um, I find that kind of interesting. There's definitely, and so you've got to think Jesus is not, um, you know, he's probably thinking, wow, I've got a lot, to, I've got a lot to do <laughs> here yet with these, with these 12, uh, 12 apostles where they are going to be where they need to be. Any other thoughts on this? Jesus's reaction, the apostles' reaction. Well, they'd have that human concern about their purse strings on their money bag. Yeah, so we, we'll get to that in a minute, but there's definitely that, you know, very practical, you know, we can't afford this. We don't have any money to go buy them all bread. Not to mention it's a remote place and there's probably no bread to be bought, you know, for a crowd of this, this size. Um, maybe let's go on to the next slide. Um, so what does Jesus say? You know, he gets this almost, like I said, three of the four accounts. I think it says, send, they, the apostles say, send them away. And Jesus has exactly the same flat response in the NIV to like three, to like each one of those times they say that. He says, um, you give them something to eat. Yeah, I think that's significant. He's just sent them out uh, and given them power. Um, and they've, they've accomplished that mission. He's now... I think hinting, um, uh, I'm, I'm starting, you guys, I hope you wake up and see, I'm starting to give you, delegate power to you. Um, I'm, I'm grooming you for, for what's ahead of you. Um, so he's starting to transition uh, power to them and hoping they'll understand that's, that's what their calling is going to be. I think that's a good point because that's uh, that you kind of get that you know they come to him and say you send them away and Jesus says no you feed them, so it's kind of definitely a transfer you know they want Jesus to deal with the problem and Jesus says no, you feed them. Um, I wonder if Jesus is talking about the same thing as they're talking about. Uh, you, you know, there's so many times in scripture where Jesus refers to himself as I am true food and, 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 and that type of, of language and whatnot. And I wonder if Jesus is actually not thinking maybe so much about the physical feeding of them at this, at this point when he, when he tells them to go do this, uh, as he is about their physical, their physical food. I, just a thought, I, I'm, I'm not certain, but it's just yeah. one of those things that maybe they're not quite on the same wavelength here when Jesus makes that statement. 
Well, I think it's fair to think, you know, whether that's whether he's thinking about it on that deeper level or not. There's definitely a part of how he's thinking about them and their importance and the compassion he feels with them. I think it's definitely much more than a physical kind of thing. You know, and the apostles are thinking about him just as practical problem. We've got 5,000 plus people to feed. How are we going to do? They're just thinking of the physical problem they have. They're not thinking about it in a spiritual way at all. Um, exactly. So I think you're dead on, Randy. That, that's, that's good. Um, it's, it's interesting to me the way he says, you know, you go in three of the four accounts, he says, you give them something to eat. Um, and so he's definitely putting it on them. In, in the account in John, um, it says, instead of you give them something to eat, his response is, to test Philip, he asked him, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? So he's a little less blunt in, in, uh, in John's account of it um, <clears throat> and sort of leading, starting to try to lead them to, you know, think about this on a couple of different levels and at least take, take some responsibility of it and ponder it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> any other thoughts on Jesus's response and his kind of what the, what the apostles are, are asking? So then what do the apostles say back um, to him? How do they respond to his, you know, you go, you feed them. How do they respond? Kind of like you'd say, you got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. They respond in a very worldly fashion. Worldly meaning what, Scott? Um, they aren't thinking, um, they, they aren't realizing they've just been giving amazing power, but they're back thinking in only worldly practical ways and not as Jesus would want them to be, uh, thinking that there's an enormous spiritual uh, opportunity here. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just think they, their thinking had, had shrunk back down to um, a uh, more fleshly point of view. All about logistics and economics in their mind right now at that point. Yeah, suddenly they're not apostles. They're fishermen, ex-fishermen ex or ex-tax collectors or ex-zealots or whatever the case may be. Yeah, they've, they've shrunk back down. Um, so in a couple of the accounts, somebody else they'd, they'd never seen anything like this before. What you know? What, where would we stand in that situation? Well, that's not any fun. We're supposed to just be critical of them, Jerry. We're not supposed to think of you know <laughs> how, <laughs> how it might feel. No, we'll talk about that a little bit. I think that's the that's the probably the crux of this miracle, and maybe why it's in here for all in all four gospels is for us to think about it in the in that way. Um, no, so we get this very practical response um, in in Mark and John. You know, you get this. You know, it'll take two hundred denarii, which is like half a year's salary for an average person in the in the area. And uh, and I think in John, it's that's focused. That's kind of an exchange between Jesus and Philip specifically. Um, and then, um, you know, you also get from, uh, from, from Mark and John, um, <clears throat> and actually from all four, you get, you know, this, we only have five loaves and two fishes. And I think in John's account, it's Andrew that finds some poor boy that has <laughs> five loaves and two fishes, <laughs> who has suddenly volunteered to share his lunch with 5,000 men plus, um, plus others. So pretty, pretty interesting, I think, this very practical response. So um, how would you summarize then the, 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 the apostles' response versus, um, versus Jesus' response, you know, what, what Jesus ends up doing? How, what's the difference between those responses? <laughs> I'm sort of asking the question there I've got at the bottom. I just phrased it differently, but. What's the flaw in their responses? How are they different from Jesus' plan? Like it says, Jesus was operating out of pure compassion 
and they're operating out of uh, a more human self-preservation level. There's definitely a motivational difference. I think that's true. Yeah, I, I think it appears to me, he's, you know, he says Jesus had compassion on them, um, but they said it'd take eight months' wages. Are we going to spend that much on them and give it to them to eat? So it's almost like, are they really worth that? Um, I don't know. It's just kind of a, and Jesus pretty much answers, yeah, they are worth that. I, I like that, Sean, because I think we, we think when we think about that that concept, that are are they worth it? I think when we think about application of this miracle to our lives, you know, and, and the things we pray for and we ask for, I think we're in danger. We need to think about, you know, when we are there things we don't pray about because we think we're not worth it to God. You know what I mean? And God, I think there's a good, strong answer here about whether some, you know, whether people are worth it or not. Right. So, you know, I think we think about maybe why we don't ask for some of the things we maybe should be asking for. It's, it's this, oh, God, you know, it's a trivial thing. We're not worth it. It's not that big. You know, there is some of that kind of discussion. So I think it's a good point to bring out. I guess I'd summarize this kind of this way. You know, the apostles focus on what they don't have. You know, we don't have enough money. We don't have any bread. And we're certainly not that worried about them. You know, so we don't have any compassion. Um, you know, Jesus is really focused on what he has, which is a lot of compassion and this obligation. And obviously, you know, his relationship with the Father. And as Scott's talked about, you know, he's already passed this, this idea on to them. They have powers to do that. You know, they have, um, they can draw on that same, same, uh, same power from God to do things, this miraculous power. So Jesus is focused been about, on about what, what can be done. He feels his compassion. He feels this obligation. He knows that there's something they can do. Um, so again, the apostles are thinking only what they can personally do themselves. And Jesus is thinking about, you know, I'm the son or whatever. You know, with God's power, there's really nothing we can't do here. You know, there's, this is not a big deal. And so it's kind of interesting, um, interesting just to compare those responses, I think. <laughs> I think Jesus is kind of moving them into moving them into uncharted territory as well. I mean, they went out on you know in cares and did did their their ministry and whatnot, but their ministry was was a ministry of repentance and, and, and the good news of Jesus. Uh, and in, in conjunction with that, to support it, they cast out demons and did healing. Now he confronts them with something that they haven't done yet, and and I don't think that they realize how vast and how great the power that they have available to them is. And so I think this is an educational moment for them as well to understand that, you know, your power just isn't limited to specific things that like healing or casting out demons. My power is, is universal and, you know, we can, we can resolve anything with this. So, and perhaps that's, that's the, the, the message here is that, you know, don't limit what your thoughts of the power that Jesus imparts to us looks like. I think that's really good. I'm going to rush this along here just a little bit to make sure we get done with this um, in 15 minutes. Just sort of thinking about what's noteworthy about the about the miracle itself and sort of having the benefit of comparing all four accounts that you guys haven't really quite had a chance to do. Um, it's interesting that Jesus, uh, look, you know, Mark, he looks, and actually at several of the other accounts, he looks up to heaven and gives thanks for that bread. So he's not... Rem He's not forgetting at all where that bread comes from, even those five loaves and two fishes. You know, he, he breaks that bread, breaks up those fish, you know, after he's given thanks to God for, for that. So he's acknowledging, you know, God is going to have a central role in whatever is going to happen here. Um, apparently, if you sort of put it all together, he sort of breaks up the five loaves. And we're talking little bitty barley loaves. They're, you know, like a dinner roll kind of size thing. Um, he breaks those up into ba basically, and then and the little fishes tears them into pieces and puts them basically in 12 baskets. Because they come back with 12 baskets, and there's an implication he's sort of giving each one of the disciples a basket with their little couple, you know, part of a barley loaf and a couple little bits of fish. Um, is sort of the implication there because they each bring back a basket full of you know some of the some of the leftover bits. Um, it says that each one of those baskets came back when the apostles brought them back, came back full of broken pieces. And it says everyone, um, all ate and were satisfied, is what the NIV says. And um, 
uh, Holman Christian says everybody ate and was filled. So it wasn't like everybody got a little snack to tide them over until they could get back to eat something. They were all filled. The Holman Christian says the word that's translated, you know, was filled there has sort of the same implication as like, you know, feeding livestock or whatever, you know, fattening up livestock to be ready to go slaughter. So it's not like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's getting significant uh, nourishment, I guess, is the, is the main thing. Um, the other thing to think about is 5,000 men. And I think, uh, you know, Matthew adds, uh, you know, in addition, besides women and children, I think is the phrase that Matthew adds there in the NIV. And so you could probably think of this as more like 5,000 households. So it could have been, you know, some single men, some, you know, couples, some families of five or, you know, so this could be 15,000 people basically that, that are here. Um, and the way they kind of counted things back in that culture, you know, they just counted the men, but that's important to understand. It's, um, it's kind of interesting to note, Mark is the only one that notes that the grass was green and John says there was lots of grass for them to sit on. So it's just kind of funny little things that are, um, that are slightly different in each one of these. Um, John definitely gives a more personal account of it. You know, Jesus is talking to Philip about the, about, you know, the, the 200 denarii and how much it would cost to buy loaves of bread. And, and with Andrew is the one that goes and finds the, the five, uh, five loaves and two fishes. And it's difficult. We don't really know anything about Andrew's motivation. Was he trying to enable the, you know, the miracle or was he sort of proving the point that there really isn't anybody all I could find was this one little boy with you know so we don't really know anything about how how that how that went um it's also interesting in John's account that at the end of the miracle he asked them to go out and collect all the leftover pieces so that and it says so let nothing be wasted and so then they go out and collect and sort of by implication more than they started out with so um my question for you is what must it have been like to have been one of the apostles? And he gives you this, you know, it says um, in a couple of the accounts, he has these people separate up into groups of 50 or 100 in these little clusters. What must have been like for Jesus to hand you this basket with half a barley loaf or less, you know, and a couple of little bits of fish and say, go feed that 100, that 100 people, go pass that basket around and feed them. What must that have been like? They probably walked around with their mouths open. <laughs> yeah. Totally amazed. Yep. Seems like that would have taken a little bit of faith, even to like, <laughs> what am I doing? These people are going to, I'm going to, they're going to string me up or whatever. I go try to feed them with a, a basket with, you know, half a loaf of bread and half a, half a roll in it. I, I can imagine turning away from Jesus with your basket going, this isn't going to end well. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, I think we all thought those kind of things. So I mean, I never had thought about it as, you know, he's basically sending each one of them off with their own like basket to go like, because he tells them kind of you go feed them and you take, you know, here, take it and distribute it. They kind of have personal ownership of this. The way if you read it and kind of parse through the account, they kind of have per each one of them has their basket and they're told to go feed this group these various groups, you know, you head off that way and you head off that way and let's go, let's go feed them. Um, what do you make of the, you know, there's, there's of this whole, uh, you know, I, I kind of highlighted a little bit, this abundance with which the, the people were fed. What can we learn from that? <clears throat> thinking about in when God gave uh, manna to the Israelites, and they were all filled. Some had a lot and some had a little, but they were all satisfied. Yeah, the, the manna thing made me wonder if that was part of collecting the abundance. It's like, you know, you were, you were fed that one meal or whatever, but you weren't, and you were you, you know, you received God's bounty and you, and you were fed and they were full, but you weren't really, you know, you, you're kind of like the manna, you know, you weren't supposed to collect except for the night before the, or the day before the Sabbath day, you know, you weren't supposed to collect more than you needed for that day. So it just kind of interesting. You know? But um, a little interesting. Go ahead, Don. A little interesting sideline is reading Oswald this morning and his little devotional book. And today's devotion 
talks about total surrender to God. And I'm kind of in my mind comparing this to the total surrender that they had to exhibit to just even walk out there with those baskets and do what they were told because in their minds they must have really been questioning them big. Yes, yeah, so I'm sure there was more than one that was thinking, yeah, this is, as Randy said, this isn't going to work out well. <laughs> this isn't going to go well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's an interesting thing. What do you, you know, what do you think the apostles learned from this? I think they went out. I mean, I, I'm just thinking of it myself. I, I, I would have taken the basket and thought, this is stupid. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go out here. I'm going to give out the couple of little bits I've got and then turn back and shrug my shoulders. Um, but when I start handing it out and miraculously, there's more in the basket and more in the basket. It had to be uh, mm -hmm. because you, because before it's always been Jesus doing the miracles and I've not really had a part in it. Now I'm I'm integral in this. I'm part of it. It had to be a faith building exercise. Yeah. yeah, I think you're going at kind of answering this question, right? Why did why do you think Jesus performed the miracle this way? I mean, obviously he could have just magically, you know, a loaf of bread and a and a fish appeared in front of everybody all the, everybody in the crowd, and you know that would have not been that would have been hard for him to do. So why did he do it this way? Maybe Sean kind of go in that direction about why it was, why the miracle was done this way. Other thoughts? Good teaching experience. For the, for the apostles, right? So definitely a learning right. experience for the apostles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Building their faith. And, and as Sean noted, they had ownership basically. I mean, it was, it was, they were a part of that miracle really. I mean, they were carrying those little baskets out there and they were magically refilling with food every time, you know, every time somebody was pulling in any end. So anyway. It does make one wonder who is actually getting fed. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, I think there's lots of levels of that. I mean, I guess my last question, if we get to it, is, you know, why did Jesus perform this miracle? And why is this one, you know, um, you know, I think that's really, um, I was looking, yeah, that's the next question. Why do you think Jesus performed this miracle? I think there's a lot of levels to that question. and um, Answers to that question. We're sort of hinting at several of those. I kind of feel like Jesus was also teaching them that, okay, these people are here. We're tired. We want to eat. But they need to eat too. And we don't want to miss this opportunity to teach them. That's more important right now. Don't let this opportunity leave. Take advantage of it. I agree with that. I was about to say something along those lines. I'm glad you beat me to it. Um, that, um, you know, they were expecting, ah, oh, good, we're going to get a little rest. And now there's a crowd. And, um, I, I don't know if Jesus was surprised or unexpected or had, you know, knowledge that this opportunity would come. I suspect not. And yet, he, with being who he was, um, he realized this, these people have come. I must respond to them. This is an opportunity. Uh, was that Carolyn who just said that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is an opportunity. Um, the Father has presented this. And Jesus was so brilliant that he, he put together, I think, on the spot, um, his response to the opportunity. I, I'm not sure this is something he had planned in advance. And just to apply to ourselves, uh, life has a lot of curveballs, and yet uh, we, we must try to turn the curveballs into opportunities. Mm -hmm. I don't think it had as much impact on the crowd as it did the apostles. 
I was thinking the exact same thing, Jerry. I, I, actually, in reading this, I got to the end, and I, and I kind of wondered even if the crowd recognized it was a miracle. Actually, uh, the account in John says that they did, though, because it immediately follows the discussion of the miracle and says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So the crowd did have a really positive, you know, sorry, it's easy to be the teacher and never at all four counts. <laughs> because you're right, in the three, in the other three, it's real, it kind of goes flat and there's no real discussion and well, reaction to the crowd. But in John, there's this real strong reaction that, wow, you know, this guy really is, he must be the prophet, come back. Exactly. We need to make him the king. So there was a real dramatic reaction to the, um, to the miracle in John. Um, and if you think about it in the way it's described in John, he links it to right after this testimony that Jesus gives about himself. And then he, um, he, he gives the, the, they do this miracle. The crowd has this really dramatic reaction to it. And it actually fulfills some prophecy in Isaiah, Isaiah 40 about the shepherd coming and, and feeding the flock and caring for the flock. So kind of interesting to think about. But yeah, definitely teaching his apostles was part of that. And, um, you know, proving like all miracles, you know, as testimony to who he is and his relationship with the Father. So um, interesting things. Um, I want us to think just for a second, we got about two minutes, you know, what can we learn from this miracle? What do, what do we get out of this miracle? What's, why is this in all four Gospels? What do I need to know about this? We need to watch for opportunities and not let them pass by because maybe we're in a hurry or whatever. That's what it says to me. So rather than limiting God's powers, we need to look for opportunities where God's, God's, God could work. Yeah, especially when God maybe is bringing them to us. We're not looking for them at the time, but to realize Maybe this is an opportunity to share because he wasn't just feeding them food. He was teaching them many things as well. And I think he was telling the apostles, this is, hmm. this is your, your job. <laughs> this is your task. Feed them spiritually and physically when you have to. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, I, I think that's, that's, that's dead on. Um, I think there's a part of it, you know, kind of going back to what Sean said earlier, you know, we need to not doubt that God really does want to meet our needs or whatever, that he does care about, does have compassion for us and others that we encounter or whatever, and that he he does want to meet those needs or whatever. So those aren't meaningless, trivial things to him. He does, he does care. And I think we also need to remember, you know, Ephesians 3.20. This says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. So we need to remember that, you know, not to let our faith or lack thereof at times or our lack of understanding and seeing where God could work to really limit what, you know, what God can do. We need to be really cautious about that. And to me, that's kind of the, the scary message here, although maybe not as scary. You know, if Philip and Andrew, after all they've already been through, you know, are struggling to think outside of the, you know, the normal physical realm of things and remember who they're with, uh, I guess it's not surprising that maybe we struggle with that too. But it is one of those things I think we need to kind of be aware of and, and, uh, and make sure that we're, we're not limiting God's, God's power. Mm -hmm. um, our ability to, to weigh in and do things or whatever because of our lack of faith or lack of understanding of how what he could do. Any final thoughts? I think Thanks, it's important Tom. to remember that, that God doesn't work independently. He works through us. And I think this was a, a circumstance that demonstrated that Jesus allowed the apostles a hand in that to make them understand that God works through you in these circumstances. And it's just like you said in 320, it says, according to the power that works within us. And so we have this, this, this power that we ourselves are the ones that oftentimes limit. Very good. I think that's like the perfect note to end on, Randy. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, we'll see you guys on the live stream in a, uh, 45 minutes or so. I'm going to have to cut this uh, off at our appointed time and go run, scurry around, do other things. But 
thanks. Great discussion this morning. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this as much as I did. Really an interesting miracle that I had never thought about quite in this way. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that too. Thank Take care. We'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks for a good lesson, John. Good job. Yeah.